Good morning, everyone. Uh, can we okay? We had a mic issue right at the end, with, right before this. Okay. Um, thanks, choir. That was that was gorgeous. That was amazing. Um, thank you for all your time that you put into all that practicing, and, and I know there's so much effort going into that. Um, this morning, uh, it was my privilege to bring to you the Word of God. We're going to be looking at John 13 again, um, just continuing on. So uh, it's a beautiful passage. Ken said a couple weeks ago that his favorite passage is the one that he's currently studying. Uh, that goes for me as well. Um, I tend to, um, once God opens up the power of the, of the Word, it's hard to ignore it. Once you really start diving in and realizing that every word's in there for a reason and every, every thought, everything that happens has happened for a, for a sovereign purpose, it's hard not to be overwhelmed with the things that you see uh, in the Word of God. So um, I'm hoping that I can share some of that with you this morning and that uh, you'll be blessed uh, as I have been um, through, through what John has written. So just uh, as uh, before we pray, let's kind of just set some context. Uh, We're in John 13. Um, Jesus is entering his passion at this point in the book of John. Uh, He's he's entered in. He's at a triumphal entry. He's raised Lazarus. Uh, The Pharisees are out to get him. Uh, Caiaphas has made his proclamation that uh, Jesus will uh, need to be sacrificed for the good of the nation. Um, And that's exactly what Jesus was wanting. That's why he came back to Jerusalem, as we saw with Lazarus. Um, And so he finds himself in Bethany. Uh, He lays Lazarus, he rides into Jerusalem, and now he's sitting with his disciples in the upper room as we get into John 13. Um, In other books, this is where we have uh, the institution of communion, which makes this an appropriate morning as we take communion, but John doesn't actually go into that. He's going to talk about some other things, and and it should dovetail perfectly into our celebration of communion this morning. So uh, with that, uh, we're in John 13. He loved his disciples to the end. And that's kind of your heading for the entire uh, rest of the book. He loves them to the end. He loved them so far, and he loved them to the end. As he considers the glory that's set before him, he's now going to take that glory, and it's going to lead him. And last time I was here in the pulpit, we talked about how that led him into serving, how that led him into washing the feet of the disciples, how we led him into um, service to them and setting an example and giving himself to them. And his, his glory that was set before him was not so much... Um, that opposed to his service, it was the thing that fueled his service. Um, This morning, we're going to look at a little bit different passage. We look at Judas, uh, and I want to kind of understand what's happening with this betrayal. I want us to kind of dive into the details that are going to be proposed by John and and put forth for us to really consider. Um, And then I want us to really kind of consider this end of the verse here where he says that Judas went into the night. And, And I want to make sure that we understand what our choice is right there. What John is facing with us right here, what, what God has brought forth from his word through, these, through this chapter for us to really think about, both believer and unbeliever. Um, and so as we get into this, um, I really want us to really kind of focus in on that, and, and hopefully we can fill in some gaps there. So with that, let's go ahead and pray um, as we get started and, and ask God's blessing on our time. Lord, we thank you for this word that you've put before us. We thank you for this morning to come and worship you. Lord, as we look at these words, we pray uh, that you would be here with us, that you would honor us with your presence, that you would be honored with our attention, uh, that we would put all distractions aside, that we would um, consider the weeks and give them all to you. And as we consider what's coming up this week, we would just lay that at your cross. Lord, we pray this morning that your spirit would be among us moving in hearts, convicting, encouraging, exhorting, or whatever is appropriate. Uh, we pray that your word will be made much of, that your cross will be made much of, that you would be made much of. Lord, we pray that we would see Jesus that much clearer this morning. Lord, help us. Help us to be your people. Help us to, to know that you are our God, and let us live in that reality. We do pray. Amen. So, um, as I said, we are in John 13 as, as we go through this. Um, he loved them to the end. He already talked about foot washing. He, stops the, he makes a statement in, um, as Peter starts to disagree that he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. So as we get into verse 18, that kind of sets the stage for what's coming next. So as he says this in verse 18, 
he says to the disciples, much to their dismay, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. And the the word chosen should kind of drip a little bit there. I know whom I have chosen. And he says, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. So let's kind of take this in reverse because it kind of helps understand. When he says, he who has raised up his heel against me or that I shared bread with, it's a... uh, uh, an idi- idiomatic expression, meaning it's just a saying that, that is meant to tell a little bit of a story. Um, the origin of it, I don't know where it really comes from. There's been all sorts of different ideas. One is that it's two friends that are in a race, and, and even though they're friends, the other one, seemingly without um, warning, trips the other one so that they fall and they stumble. Um, probably more likely it comes from an animal who you fed, who you've cared for, and then it kicks, it kicks or it bucks uh, like, a, like a horse or something like that, and drops its rider. Um, I would probably put that more of a cat, where you feed the cat, and what do you get out of it? Absolutely nothing. That would be much more the expression. I think that's the origin of where it comes from. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the idea is betrayal, right? That I've poured into this. We've been family. We've loved each other, and yet you have, have treated that goodness with evil. And Jesus says this is in response to the Scripture. And the Scripture that he's talking about comes from Psalm 41, Well, what is Psalm 41 about? It's David, David the precursor to the Messiah, David the one whose life was a type of the Messiah. He says that he's being betrayed after loving one another, after sharing his bread, after sharing a meal, after sharing life with somebody, he's getting uh, evil returned to him. He's getting a betrayal. And so the life of David, Psalm 41 is not messianic by itself. But the life of David, the patterns of David are a type. And so they tell us what the Messiah is going to have to deal with, the kinds of things that the Messiah is going to have to deal with. And so in response to that, Jesus is saying, just like the precursor to the Messiah, I, as a true Messiah, am I going to feel this betrayal? So that's where the scripture is coming in. But but where I really want to focus here is on this beginning expression, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. Not all of you are clean. Not all of you are clean. I know whom I have chosen. Now, when I read this, uh, I generally see the word chosen, and I bucket it under the you and tulip. Maybe you're like me, and you've kind of got your quota verse. You've got the checkbox. But there's more here than just chosen, right? This isn't just about unconditional election, right? This isn't just about salvation. There's so much more going on here. Jesus is saying that he knows whom he has chosen. Well, that includes who he's chosen. These 12 men that are enjoying the meal with him right here in the upper room, he has chosen them. And that choosing includes Judas. Judas is in this room by the sovereign choice of God. In fact, I'm going to take this even further. It's by the sovereign choice of Jesus. I have chosen Now, I know who is chosen. I have chosen. I have brought these people in. I have set them right here. You are at this table for a reason. Each one of you has a purpose, including you, Judas. I have brought you close. I have shared life with you. I have walked with you for three years. You've seen me feed 5,000. You've seen me raise Lazarus. You've seen me give sight to the blind, heal the the leper, and, and everything. You've been there with me. We've walked through this. You've seen it all with me. Judas. And that was by my choice. I have brought it in. It has a purpose. And so why does he mention this? Because if you think about what's about to happen, the disciples are completely unprepared. Their picture is they're a glorious Messiah who's going to come in. He's going to restore Israel. And it's going to be wonderful, a wonder. And, and, and there is going to be much rejoicing if you're a Monty Python fan. And they're all going to raise their hands and they're going to sing Hosanna and everybody's going to be excited. But you, Jesus kind of pops burst their bubble, right? He doesn't come in a war horse. He comes in on a donkey. He doesn't talk about restoration. He talks about death. He doesn't talk about all the things that they're supposed to talk about. And so as they watch the things unfold, just like David, they're going to see somebody coming and getting the upper hand on the guy they thought that was the Messiah. They think it's going to look like defeat. 
They're going to watch the Pharisees come and arrest him. They're going to see him beaten. They're going to see him crucified. And, and, and all these things are going to happen, just like with David. It's going to feel like betrayal. It's going to feel like everything's against them. It, even the weather is going to get dark for three hours. It's going to feel like even the weather is against them. Everything is going to feel like it's spinning out of control. So what's the thought? Well, Jesus makes it very clear. This is all happening by my choosing. This is all happening exactly the way I wanted it. Not exactly the way that God wanted it and we all have to live with it, exactly the way that I wanted it to happen. Just like we learned last week, everything's happening here. When, when, when Jesus prayed, um, if there is another way, and what does Steve Ramish say? There's no other way. This is the right way. This is the best way. This is the only way. And this is what Jesus is choosing. This is the best way. So as we look at Judas, Judas is not a, I guess somebody's got to send Jesus to the cross. Judas was brought in specifically because he would be that guy. This is all happening by the sovereign choice of Jesus. Just as he wants it, just as he would have it, just as he would bring him in. Why does he say this? Well, let's go to the next verse. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So why does he tell us this? Because he wants us to understand that nothing is spinning out of control. Nothing has anything that's any out of the control of, of God, of Jesus. And he says, but look what he says. I love this. You may believe that I am he. A better a translation and the more literal translation is that you may believe that I am. He already said this once to them and almost got stoned. When he said, well, before Abraham was, I am. Ego a me. That's exactly what this verse says. That, I, that you may believe that I am. But this isn't just about omniscience. Don't simplify it to just say, Jesus knows everything, therefore he's God. That's not what he's saying. Okay, that is what he's saying. He is saying that. But he's saying more than that, right? He's saying that he wants them to believe that all this is happening for a purpose, for a plan. Sean, as he prayed this morning for all the people that are facing health issues, it would be a dark day unless you believe that there's more to this life. When we park and we think that there's nothing more than just right now, then we've lost the battle. As believers, we can't get stuck in what's happening right now. We're in election season. These, these political ads, they just they make my blood boil because they're so infuriating. And they're so difficult to, to, to get through and you realize that whatever you're seeing is not the truth and you know that there's something more. And some of them are pretty entertaining, I have to admit, but, that, but they're just irritating, ultimately. And it's tough not to lose yourself in this world. But Jesus comes to his disciples and says, as you watch this, know that I am. Know that I rule over all of these things. Know that I have sovereign control over all these things. Know that everything that's happening has a purpose. It's coming to pass, and it's happening because I want it this way, because it's the best way, and because there will be something coming out of all of this that's going to make all of this just fade into the past, and you're going to see a glory like you've never seen before. And he wants them to grasp that. And so he says, watch these events. And I'm telling you, so that as you see them coming, and they won't do this, obviously, but as you see them coming, and even more so as you look back on them, you will know that I am. And look what he says in verse 20. Most assuredly. That's the New King James way of saying, amen, amen. Verily, verily right? This is without a doubt, most assuredly. This will, heaven and earth will pass away before this will not happen. That's what he's saying. Most assuredly, there is no doubt you can put your whole life on this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying that there's life after the cross, as they watch the cross and they watch the one that they were sure is the Messiah die on the cross, they will all have this feeling like there's nothing left. We've lost 
Everything we've hoped for just went out the door. Everything we hoped for just died on that cross. As we put them in the tomb, there went our hope. That's, their, that's going to be the temptation. That's where they're going to want to go. That's their mindset and what's going to happen in their heart. And Jesus tells them, most assuredly, without a doubt, I say to you that whoever receives, whomever I send, receives me. Well, if he was dying on a cross, then why is he going to send out disciples? And who are they going to receive if they're going to receive? It didn't make any sense unless, unless he wasn't going to die. Unless there was something else going to happen. Unless there was some glory that's, not, that's going to be revealed that hasn't been revealed already. Unless there's something that happens after the cross, this verse means nothing. But if there is something that happens after the cross, then this verse means everything. And so he gives them something to grab onto. He says, everything's happening by my choice. Everything's happening exactly the way that I want to. In fact, everything's happening so perfectly that I am is going to rule over everything. And when you go out in my name, they're going to receive it. And they're going to receive him who sent me. They're going to receive the whole deity. I am is going to rule. And as they watch their Savior die on the cross, that's got to be the anchor. That's got to be the thing that holds them. And by God's will, it will be the thing that's going to hold them. And it's going to be the thing that's going to light them on fire and send them out in, 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 soon enough in the book of Acts. But right now, he's telling them in preparation so that they have something to hold on to. And so we've got to do this too. We've got to be able to hold on to these things. As we think about what comes next, as we think about what's happening in our lives, whether it's anything from kids all the way through death, as we're thinking about um, facing our death day all the way through in, enjoying these little ones that come into, the, into life, as we face job pressures and family pressures and financial pressures and election pressures and all these things, do we keep in mind that there's a bigger picture? Do we keep in mind that, that there's something else in here, that I am rules, that this is not the end? that there is an eternity that's waiting for us. And it's lived out in moments. And it's lived out in opportunities for us to be able to take these moments and lived out in, in opportunities to take these moments and transform them into etern- internal realities. And yes, we have to deal with the decisions. And yes, we have to deal with changing diapers. And yes, we have to deal with spankings. And yes, we have to deal with questions around job changes. And yes, we have to deal with questions about nursing homes and hospice care and all the different difficult, very difficult decisions. But do we look at them and say, this is the I am, and these are expressions of the I am in life. We've got to see this. The disciples saw, had to see this too. As they watched Jesus go to the cross, they had the ultimate I am moment. Can I believe that this is the I am? Can I grasp that there is more to this, that there's life after this event? Can you believe that there's life after this important decision you have to make? As you look at the death of a loved one, can you believe that there is something more? That you remain after they have passed for a reason? Can you grasp that? The disciples had to grasp that. Jesus gave them so much. I want you to know that this has happened because I am the I am. So you can grasp that, that you can hold it, that you can have a firm foundation in what I'm saying. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay? That's just the stage for what we're about to talk about. Because he's trying to get to them to realize that there is more to life and that he rules and he chooses. And he has the control over every facet and everything testifies to who he is. Now let's go into verse 21 because now we add the complexity to this verse, uh, this set of verses. Now when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. Wait a second, troubled in spirit? You're the great I am. You're in control of all things. Every one of these things is happening because you wanted it to happen. You know all things. You know the hearts of men. You are in complete control. You have the power to bring these things to pass. He already told him in John 10, I lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. But he's troubled. That means that he has an internal churning. The idea is, is, is waves uh, of like a, a bubbling geyser. That's what he's feeling. His, his stomach is in knots. His, his, he's got an internal sickness, a revulsion that he's looking at. And it says he's troubled in spirit. Well, how can, or maybe better, what is it that takes the I am, who is in control of all things, what troubles his spirit? How can the one who knows all things and controls all things be sick? 
I'd be sick to his stomach at what he's seeing, of, of feeling a holy revulsion. How, what is it that takes the Holy One of God and affects him so much? And he says this, and testified most assuredly, keep that word in mind, verily, verily, I say to you, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. So on one hand, we have the sovereignty of God. We have the fact that he has chosen, the fact that everything's happening by his choice. And yet here he's troubled because he says that without a doubt, just as true as it is that I will live on, just as true that there will be a gospel to take out, just as true that there will be a kingdom presence, that is just as true that I will be betrayed through this. The thing that will bring about that kingdom is betrayal. Just as sure. Most assuredly, he says two things right there. Most assuredly, there is life out of the cross, and most assuredly, the cross is going to come by betrayal. And so what stirs him? What gives him that inner sickness? What, it, it, the fact that he's going to be betrayed. So here we have that beauty of sovereignty and love facing and kissing, as some, as some commentators say. Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Why? I've chosen I've chosen every one of you. All 12 of you sit at this table because I wanted you to. I have brought you with me. I have chosen you. I have, I have let you see. Some of you have seen the transfiguration. All of you have seen the miracles. Every one of you have heard the words from the best teacher that's ever walked this earth. Every one of you knows the testimony. Every one of you has, has had my power literally in your hands. You see me calm waves. All of you have seen these things. I've shared, I've poured my life into you. I've loved you with the best that I can offer. The power of God has been poured into you, sometimes literally throughout my ministry, and one of you will betray me. The sovereignty of God does not lead to a stoic, passive deity. The sovereignty of God means that he knows everyone individually. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you've done. He knows exactly every deed you've made, every thought that's gone through your head. And he knows it with intimacy, not with carelessness, but with intimacy. And when he knows this, he's poured his life into these 12 men. And so as he does so, he's loved them. And he's loved them so purely that to have one of them betray him, it kills him. It hurts him. His heart is broken by what's about to happen. The fact that he controlled it didn't mean that it didn't hurt. The fact that you may take your child into the, into the bathroom to give them a spanking because they've been disobedient and you want to correct their heart doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Sometimes literally. When I spanked Aiden for the first time, I knew I had to start getting something else because when I spanked him, it started hurting my hand. Literally. Literally. And then he looked back to me and said, are you going to spank me yet? And I said, i got to start figuring something else out because this isn't good enough, right? Sometimes it hurts. But even more so, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart that your child whom you've loved and poured your life into doesn't want the things that are the best. It hurts your soul to know that they're choosing the wrong things. And so you're left with this decision, do I leave it or not? And for Jesus, he's got to engage. It doesn't not break his heart. But it doesn't stop him from carrying out the plan of God either. He knows what's best, and he has chosen what's best, and he is moving towards what's best, but it doesn't mean that he's passive, or he's stoic, or he doesn't care. He loves it. He loves each person. He loves them to the end. And he lo he, God gave his only begotten son out of love. It doesn't mean everyone's chosen to election, it certainly means that everybody's going to watch the sun. So he says these things, and he's troubled in spirit. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Um, and so the disciples look around. You've got to love their expression. The disciples um, are not known necessarily for being the most observant. Um, if you've read the Gospels for any length of time, the disciples are almost sometimes in just for comic relief. Um, they, they do add a certain interest uh, to the gospel that uh, you couldn't get without human error, and they provide plenty of it. And so the disciples look around at one another, and they're perplexed, he says. He doesn't, they don't know what he's spoken of. The word perplexed means they don't understand what's going on. They're kind of at a loss for words. They don't really understand, like, what am I supposed to do with that information? They're looking around at each other as 
is it you? I, can someone explain to me what Jesus means by that? They don't want to admit to Jesus that they don't understand, especially because one of them is a betrayer, so maybe I don't want him to really point to me. So they just look around at each other. They look around at each other and they're perplexed. Now what I want you to notice is no one, according to John, no one looked over at Judas and said, my money's on him. Nobody looked at that. These 12 men looked around the table at each other and they were perplexed. They looked around at each other and they said, it could be any of us. I have no idea. I don't know. Who is it? Who could it be? I have no idea which one of us it could be. He says it is, but how are we supposed to know? What does it mean to betray him? What does it mean to be the betrayer? I, I, I don't know how to think through this. I don't know how to process it. And so they look about perplexed, and they just can't quite, they can't quite figure this out. Okay? Now, as we get there, I want you to hold that thought for a second, because John gives us this in verse 23. Now, there was a leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Now, some of you um, probably have studied this much more in depth than I have. Some of you have a MacArthur Study Bible, so you're immediately reading the notes. Uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved is John. Okay, there is some debate about that, but we're just going to leave it there. It's John. I don't want you to get caught up on that. I want you to read this in context. The bosom is the chest area. Okay? So literally you could see that another was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. So that could be literal. I think it's going to be metaphorical. As we look at this, the word bosom is used a few different ways throughout Scripture. One of them is when and the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus was brought up and he was put into the bosom of Abraham. Same idea. Um, in John 1.18, Jesus, is, as the son, actually comes from, he, he inhabits the bosom of the father. So it's metaphorical, okay? The bosom, in case you're wondering what that is, uh, it's not the modern term for it, um, the bosom was actually extra material that was in the chest area of a garment. Um, the closest thing is, um, some of your parents have seen these, they look like uh, pretty much the best thing in a Sunday afternoon nap, is uh, you hold this for your baby, it's like a sling, and you put the baby inside, and then you can kind of tuck the baby in and cover their head, and the baby's held really close to the chest, nice and tight, nice and warm. They can hear the mother's heartbeat. It's very comforting. It's very relaxing. I wish I could have one myself, and it just puts people to sleep, right? That's what it's for. It's to hold tight. It's actually in, in uh, I think it's Matthew 6, that's where your treasure is stored, in your bosom. It was a part of the garment that was for children, but it was also for storing up treasure or anything you wanted to keep safe. You kept it close to your heart. You wrapped it up. You covered the baby's head and held it tight. So I think this is metaphorical. John says there was leaning on Jesus' bosom held tight by Jesus, one of his disciples, and it was the one whom Jesus loved. And so as John talks about this, it's him. And so as we look at this, we've got the sovereignty of, of what's going to happen. There's a sovereignty of betrayal that one of you is going to do this. And they're all looking around the room trying to figure out what to think about this. And here he says, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, held tight in the arms of Jesus. So now I've got chosen in two different comments. I've got chosen on one hand that says one of you is going to betray me and that's just the way it should be. And then I've got another one in verse 23 that I'm chosen and I'm held in the bosom of Jesus. That I'm in the sling. That I am safe. That there is nothing in this world that can touch me. There is nothing. Why? Because I am the one whom Jesus loved. I am I'm the one who was chosen under his love. I'm the one who's chosen to be tucked in, to be held tight, whose arms will never fail, whose, whose heartbeat it rings in my ear, that, that brings me calm, that defines my days, that defines my meaning, who, who loves me. This is how I'm going to choose to define myself. Judas, you can be betrayed, and you can be the one whom Jesus betray, that betrayed Jesus, who Jesus chose to betray him, but as for me, by the grace of God, I am the one who Jesus chose to hide in his bosom, to love, to care, to be the one that Jesus would never give up on. So as you think about choosing, don't file it under you in Tulip. This is the one who has control, who both loves 
and chooses the direction of the world. Let that weigh on you. Let that encourage you. As a believer, let that bring hope. There's nothing, nothing that can touch you when you're in the bosom of Jesus. But for the non-believer, just realize you are dealing with the one that holds the fate of the universe. And he misses nothing. He knows everything and he knows you intimately. And there's nothing hidden from his gaze. So this cuts both ways as we think about choosing. There's one leaning on Jesus' bosom and one of his disciples, and it was Jesus whom, whom Jesus loved. So let's get into this now as we start to focus a little bit more on Judas. Um, verse 23, Simon Peter, and therefore motioned to him, John, to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Now, they're all looking around at each other, and they're all trying to figure this out. So John is sitting, and, he, and he's the one that has access to Jesus. And then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, that's not the same word as bosom. Leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, for this, uh, I want you to get a picture in your head, okay? Because this will, uh, hopefully will help bring it to life. The, the idea here is not uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper table, right? So if you've seen that painting, you probably have. It, it's, it's a big, long table that's like the size of this whole stage, and the disciples are all about it, milling about. Jesus is in the center, and the disciples are all milling about on either side, right? That's not the way it was. What would have happened is it's going to be a low table that's low to the ground, probably round, and all the disciples are laying on the ground, okay? That was a normal way of doing things in their culture. And they're, they're laying on their left arm like this, and they're eating with their right, okay? I want you to keep that in mind. So they're, they're laying on one arm, and they're eating with their right hand. So they've got one hand. So as you think about that, that kind of limits your motion. This isn't a game of like duck, duck, goose or musical chairs where you get up and you get to shift around or anything like that, right? They're laying on the ground. They are on one arm. They've got one arm free. So as Jesus picks up the bread, I want you to kind of keep that in mind. But for now, just understand that Peter looks over across the table and he looks at John and he says to John, hey, ask him who it is. Probably a little more subtle than that, but he was just kind of like give some head motion or something that says, ask Right? And he's sitting there trying to pretend like no one else noticed. And he's trying to get John to do something that he couldn't do because this is Peter. And Peter never shies away from opening his mouth. And he was too far away to ask, so he thought he'd be a little more subtle this time, and he's going to set somebody else to do it. So John asked him who it is. And John, who's laying like this along with Jesus, kind of leans over like this and says, Lord, who is it? Right? And so when you think about that, and the reason I do that and look really stupid doing that was because that means that John has to be close enough to Jesus to ask him a private question. Why does that matter? Because that puts John most likely at the right hand of Jesus. Jesus is the host of this whole dinner. He's sitting here at this table. He is the one that's putting over this Passover feast. He, everyone's looking to Jesus. And Jesus has sovereignly chosen the order of how everyone sits. Why? Because he chooses everything. And he chooses to have John sit right here to his right. And John is able to lean over and literally put his head on Jesus' chest and ask him, Lord, who is it? And it's a beautiful picture because John doesn't feel awkward doing this. He knows he has access to the Savior. Why? Because he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. What does that mean? Because he hides himself in Jesus' bosom. How? By the choice of Jesus. And he feels such access, and he feels such faith, and he feels such openness and such love by the open arms of Jesus that he can actually lean over to the point where he can whisper to the Savior, Lord, who is it? I have a question. I want to know. I, I, I know that you will love me and honor that question, and you will love to hear from me. And I feel no awkwardness about bringing my heart before you. And so he leans over to Jesus and he says, Lord, who is it? And he says it in quiet tones. And, and, and Peter's looking at him saying, probably saying, louder, louder, I can't hear you. And, but John whispers this to Jesus and he says, Lord, who is it? And there's this beautiful thing. So there's the bosom of Jesus opens this up and he, and he knows he's going to be loved. And, and Jesus doesn't push him away and says, that's awkward, dude, take personal space, right? Instead, he brings them in. He says, let me tell you. Let me tell you. There's no rejection. There's no impatience. There's no rush. Jesus just lets John gather close and ask a question. 
That's the definition of prayer right there. God, gather close. Put your head on his breast. Explain your heart. Ask your questions. Ask, and he will, he will answer. So verse 26, Jesus answered John, and he says, It is he to whom I give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, I got to admit, I'm reading this, before I thought about what was actually happening and realizing this is a private question to John, I kind of felt like the disciples had to be some of the dumbest people on the face of the planet, because it seems like it's pretty obvious that when Jesus dips the bread in and gives it to Judas, everybody on the table should have said, Oh, him. The answer is made clear, but they didn't get it. And I always thought, how daft can you be? But in this case, there's something more going on here, and this is the thing that's really powerful. So I want you to keep digging in with me. And and if you haven't heard anything I said, I don't blame you, but dig in here because this is where it becomes incredibly beautiful, okay? So John is sitting here, and he leans over, and he says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus says, John, here's the answer. It's who I'm going to give this bread. Now, the word bread is actually better translated as morsel, okay? So I know it's bread. We've got the breaking of bread, um, but this isn't Olive Garden. It's not like his unlimited breadstick. So he's not just picking up a breadstick out of the basket and saying, this guy, right? And he flings a little bit of, of, of butter up. That's not what's happening. The word is better translated morsel. And I, and I found this description. It's really helpful to me. Um, this comes from an old publication. He says this. No incident of oriental meals is more celebrated in Western narrative than the giving of the morsel or sop to a table neighbor as a mark of favor. So uh, a little bit of background. The word translated bread is a, translation, a translator's choice. The word actually just means chunk right? And so the old English versions actually use the word sop, the idea being that it was some choice chunk of something. Bread could be bread, it could be something else, it could be meat. And you would take it, you dip it into a sauce, and then you give it to somebody else. So this thing was, was not just a piece of bread, it was something that was a gift, okay? So this description continues. It was given to a table neighbor as a mark of favor. Since the dishes are generally either stews or cooked almost to pieces, the fingers can easily tear off a morsel. This is dipped into a sauce, thus becoming the sop, because it pulls up the sauce, right? Um, And it's thrust directly into the favored one's mouth. So husbands, you have homework tonight. I want to see this done, right? So you're going to pick this up, you're going to choose it, you're going to put in the favors, the sop, must, according to all oriental rules, be considered as a mark of honor. A mark of honor. And in Jesus giving it to Judas, we must, unless we look further below the surface than we have any light, see only love and goodwill. So Jesus looks at this chunk, and he, at, at this food, and he takes the choice piece of meat, probably the paschal lamb, probably the, the, the Passover lamb, and he takes the chunk, he dips it in sauce, and he gives it to Judas himself. The host of the meal picks the choicest piece of meat, and he gives it to Judas. So the point here was answering John's question, absolutely. Whoever I give this morsel to is the one. That answers John's question. But think about the event that's happening. I told you how they're sitting. They're sitting with one arm here and one arm free. If Jesus is sitting, or is John sitting right here next to Jesus on his right hand, and Jesus picks up something and gives it to Judas, that means he's got to be within arm's length. And if John's sitting here, then who's sitting right here? Who's sitting right next to Jesus? At the left hand of Jesus, the most honored place at a feast, who's sitting there? Well, if it's whoever I give this morsel to, that's got to be Judas. He's not reaching across the table. He's not picking it up, getting up, and bringing it to Judas because Judas was left at the last seat of the table, the one that's right next to the kid table. That's not where he's sitting. Judas is sitting at the left hand of Jesus. He's sitting at the place of honor in the feast. He's sitting right next to the I am. 
And who put him there? Jesus, because Jesus chose every one of them. And he's sitting right here, and Jesus picks the choice thing, and he himself dips it in the sauce, and he himself gives it to Judas. And he says, Judas, take this. This is from me. This is a gift. This is the best thing. And this is the Lord. This is the I am. This is the one who's the Savior of all things. He is the the Word of God, the one who was created. He knew Judas intimately. He is the one that picks up this morsel, and he is the one that gives it to Judas right there on the spot. And he says, Judas, take this. And he gives it to him. And John's just sitting here watching. This is why I think John doesn't necessarily record the, the communion ceremony. He knows it's been done by other, other gospel writers, but he said there's something beyond that that's happening, that's illustrating what it means for Jesus to break bread and say, this is my body given for you, because he's watching this drama take place. He's watching this. Jesus himself sitting there at the table. John's got a, a, a firsthand bird's eye view of this whole thing, and he's watching this as Jesus takes this chunk and he gives it to Judas. And in verse 27 now after, um, yep. now after the piece of bread, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said, do what you do quickly. Now, you got to love this, because he's taken this chunk, and he's taken this gift, and he's given this to Judas. And as he gives this to Judas, he says, what you do, do quickly. And Judas, in that moment, has this amazing moment to, to live. There, there's, there's eternity. Time and eternity are kissing at this moment. Judas has a choice to make. Jesus, as he picks up this morsel, he gives this, and he says, Judas, take this. And when he does this, it's not just the meat that he's giving to Judas. He's giving himself. This is the Lord, the, the, the God who's, who is giving him a choice and a gift. And when you think about this, Judas has walked with Jesus. He's seen all the miracles. He has all the testimony. There is no doubt that he has heard Peter say, you have the words of life. Where else would we go? He was right there, nodding his head. He knows what happened. He saw Lazarus emerge from the tomb. He saw the blind man see again. He saw the leper healed. He saw the demons driven out. He was right there the whole time. He saw everything. So this piece of meat um, that he gives is, is a representation. Judas, you know who I am. You know what I've offered. You know that this is the gift of God, that this is God right before you. You know, as in this meat, that everything hangs right now. You have a decision to make. Your eternity is right now. Your eternity is hanging on this moment. This moment, do what you do quickly. Make that decision. Make a choice. Who will it be? There's nothing more that can be offered at this moment. There's nothing more that Judas didn't know. There is nothing more for him to learn. There is no testimony that could be offered that Judas doesn't already have. He has seen the Lord in action. He has known all the doctrine. He, as he looks at this meat, Jesus is bringing Judas to a moment. Choose this day whom you will serve. What will your decision be? What will it be? This is the gospel message in a nutshell right here, right? This is it. I don't know, every one of you, you may have come right now to the same moment. Here is the word of God. You know your sin. You've heard this gospel before. What decision will you make right now? This is Jesus offering himself, offering you the best, offering you the choice. Here is God himself at your doorstep, giving of himself and saying, will you take this? Will you take this? And I get it. This is the, we started talking about sovereignty, but look where we've arrived. The sovereign choice of God was to offer Judas a choice. And you had that same choice this morning. Where will you be? Believer, are you facing a sin that you are tempted with and you are thinking about giving into? Non-believer, what are you, why are you here? Why are you here? Here is the cross. Here is Jesus. He's offering. This is your moment. This is your moment. This was Judas' moment. What you do, do quickly. Choose today. What will you do? 
What will you do? That's got to ring in our ears. What will you do? Make that choice. Live with it. This is your eternity. You are not guaranteed another moment to choose this gospel. You are not, you may not ever be faced with a choice for Jesus again. This is your moment. Judas, this is your moment. Well, Judas makes his choice. He grabs the bread, and then Satan entered into him. It, it could be that he was literally possessed. It could just mean a, it could just be an expression saying that he chose Satan's way. I, I don't know the answer to that one. I will tell you this. Look what it says. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. And then look what it says in verse 20, um, 28. Um, sorry. Verse 30. Now, having received the piece of bread, as Jesus holds aloft the morsel, he gives it to Judas and says, do what you do quickly. Guess what Judas did? He took it. He took the bread. He took the morsel. He grabbed the meat. He ate it. Maybe Jesus actually put it into his mouth. I don't know if he went that far. But either way, Judas accepted the gift. He accepted. He took it wholeheartedly. He said, great, thank you very much. That looked like a great breadstick. And he grabs it. And then what does he do with it? He runs out the door. He leaves. He takes the best that God offered him, and he loved it. And then he went and betrayed him. How much is that? That's, that's mankind. That's sin in a nutshell. The goodness of God is poured out. The grace of God is poured out in each one of us. The, we see the wonder of God. We see it in the face of a baby. We see it I mean, the leaves are changing. It's a beautiful creation. We see the testimony of God in our lives. And we take it, and then we slap him in the face as we reject him. That's the nature of sin. That's Romans 1 in a nutshell. He shows the goodness, the grace, the magnificence, and what do we choose? We make the creature into our idol. Judas took the bread. Judas took the bread. He took it and then he left. He took it then he left. How sad is that? Judas made his choice. What you do, do quickly. That is our choice this morning. That is our choice. Let's finish up this passage, uh, verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said to him, for some thought, because Judas had the money box, or money bag is probably a better translation, that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that we should give something to the poor. So uh, Judas was over the money bag. Many of you have probably heard that before. Um, this is a position, he's essentially an accountant. So that kind of proves a couple things. I'm not going to make any accountant jokes because I give those all to Michael and Taylor anyways. But this is basically means that he's pretty smart. Okay? He knows what he's talking about. And that doesn't mean he just knows how to count. He actually knows how to uh, out, lay out money. Okay? So he was pretty smart. He knew all things. He knew a lot of things. But this is what it also means. It means that he was considered to be the most trustworthy of the group. He was the last person anyone suspected of being the betrayer. No one pointed at him because they thought for sure it can't be Judas. It must be somebody else. Peter actually just rejected Jesus' foot washing. Maybe it's him. Nobody looked at Judas. Even as Judas gets up to leave the table, they're all still giving Judas an honest shake at what they think of him. Oh, he's going to give something to the poor. He's going to go run an errand for Jesus. He, they think that he's totally above board. He's the last person they thought would actually commit this sin. That tells us that Judas did a great job of hiding everything about himself. He knew what his plan was. It was probably circulating in his head for quite a while. He knew what he was going after, and nobody picked up on it. How great is his hypocrisy? How amazing is his ability to hide his true nature? How deceitful is sin? I wish we could all say that the bad guy looks like Darth Vader. You knew in Star Wars when Darth Vader came in, you knew that was the bad guy, partly because the music was pretty ominous. And you knew that you were going to hate that guy. And you knew there was something about him, right? And I wish it was always like that, but it's not. 
Sin is deceitful. It gets in the heart. It weighs in. And it doesn't always show its fruit right away, even as it grows, even as it picks up in the heart. And Judas let this grow in him, and nobody knew it. Don't be, don't be a slave to your hypocrisy this morning. Choose this day. Choose this day. Verse 30, having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. John tells us it was night, not because uh, he just needs a time frame. Certainly it was. The meal was an evening thing, and we're going to see that he's going to be tried overnight, which is completely illegal and wrong. But nonetheless, that's not necessarily why it was said. John says that Judas went out, and it was night, for a couple reasons. First, the betrayal is going to kick off the cross. The betrayal is going to bring Jesus under arrest in a few chapters. And so we know that it's night. Darkness is descending. Darkness is falling. Darkness is upon them. And it's going to look like darkness is reigning. It looks like all is lost. It looks like the power of evil. It looks like the power of sin is going to get the upper hand. Everything looks like it's going downhill. Absolutely. It was night. But I want you to think about this from Judas' standpoint. Judas just left the light of the world. He left the light of the world to head into darkness. The choice that he made was to leave the light. The choice that he made was to head out into darkness. He chose the darkness over the light. He had the choice. He had the opportunity. Everything was before him. And what did he choose? He chose darkness. He chose darkness, and that's what he went into. And, and that's what he decided to make his life after, and he got silver. And then he hung himself when he, and the reality set upon him because he wasn't given a choice again. He wasn't given a choice again. As we come to the communion table, I want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to look and consider what does this bread mean to you? What does this wine mean to you? Where are you with this God? And before you get too down on yourself and think, oh my gosh, well, I already, I struggled with pornography, so I'm forever lost. I'm struggling with anger. I, I don't know what to do about alcohol. I, I just, I, I love the party. I understand that. And you need to leave that sin. But I also want to encourage you. Judas was offered a morsel. You're offered a morsel. But let me encourage you with this. For those that took the morsel, it ends with a palace. In John 14, the next thing he says to his people is, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. The picture is not, a, it's not an audio adrenaline song. This is actually a picture of a palace of overwhelming, all inspired, everything, all the, the most you can think of is in this house. There is plenty of room. There is plenty of providence. Everything is given to you. That's the picture that he's going to give to his disciples in the very next chapter. So it starts with a morsel and ends with a palace. For Judas, it started with a morsel and ended with darkness. But you, believer, you have it all. As we take this bread and we take this wine, you have it all. This is a down payment. This is a precursor to the palace that you will live in and for eternity. So love it. Bring it in. Bring it close. Take this bread and wine. And I know it's little styrofoam pieces of bread, but just take it and look through it. Look through it. Consider what it means. Consider what you mean. Consider that you, as a believer, by trusting in the Lord, are held tight in his bosom. That no one can touch you. Be the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, and there, um, if I could get the um, ushers to um, get ready to hand out the elements. Uh, we'll go ahead and take this. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us as we finish up, and then um, we'll go through with communion. Lord, we thank you for these words. And we thank you for the sober picture of Judas and the decision that he made. We thank you for the brilliance of the grace that you put before him. The fact that you offered him such a beautiful choice and such an eternal choice. And yes, we know he made the wrong one, Lord. And we know that you have done that by your hand and by your purpose. But Lord, May our heart break as we look at what this man chose. And Lord, we pray for your grace this morning. We pray for your grace to reign in this, in this church. 
We pray for your grace to reign through your word, that you would be honored, that you would be made much of, and that many would come and hide themselves in you, Lord. As you open your arms, as you invite all to come to you, we pray that so many would listen. Lord, that you would be honored, you be glorified in the bringing of people to yourself. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who have heard this message. We pray that you would just bring many to yourself, even this morning. Welcome them to your table. In your name we pray. Amen.